I want you to turn in your Bible, if you would, to the book of 2 Timothy. And while you're turning, I'll say that what Brother um, Wagner said is a two-way street. And that is that um, hopefully we have shown ourselves to be friends to you down through these years, but I can honestly say that you have shown yourself to be friends to me and Welcome Baptist Church, and um, Brother Wampler and Brother Wagner both through the years have not, and I've said this about Brother Wampler um, some time back when he was at the church, but not only have they stood with me, but they've stood for me, and you have stood with him and them when they stood for me. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's all right. You don't need to know. But uh, I, I thank God for the church and your pastor and his family. And it's an honor to be here today. I mean that with that from the heart. It's an honor to be with you. I don't feel like much of a, what you might say, a homecoming preacher. <laughs> but I do have a message that I believe the Lord's put on my heart that I hope will be a help to the church. And because in these days, when I think about homecoming, I think about uh, it's a time that we, we look back and we thank God for what he has done. And then we look around and we thank God for what he's doing. And then probably most importantly, we look forward and think about, you know, the future of Resurrection Baptist Church and where are we going to be 10 years from now. We may be in heaven 10 years from now, but, but if the Lord doesn't come, where's the church going to be? And I have lived long enough and been in the ministry long enough to I am becoming increasingly alarmed at what I have seen, especially over the past few years. I've, I've been pastoring for, in October will be 28 years, and um, it seems like just in the last, I don't even know how to put a number on it, but in the last few years, it seems like things have accelerated uh, toward a falling away from the faith. And that's the burden of my heart today is really more, more than anything, the future of the church. And so I want you to bow with me and let's pray. And then I'll read the text that I'm going to start with and then try to bring the message. So would you join your heart with me and let's ask the Lord for help today. Father, we bow before you, thankful for this day and your blessings. I thank you so much, Lord, uh, for Pastor Wagner and also uh, Brother Wampler and Resurrection Baptist Church and what they've meant to me down through the years. I just thank you so much, Lord, for the truth that's been preached from this pulpit and I pray, Lord, that I would honor you and be faithful to your word today. And then may somehow I be a vessel that you could use to communicate the truth to your people. And if there's one that's here that's lost, I'd ask you to speak to their heart and save them before it's eternally too late. Please sober us, speak to us, give us ears to hear. And then, Lord, even beyond that, help us to respond to that which you've spoke to us about. And we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. 2 Timothy chapter 1, and I'm going to begin reading in verse number 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in thee also. 
And I'm going to stop reading there. I will, we will look at some more of this text in a few minutes. But I want to begin by pointing out the intimate relationship that was between the Apostle Paul and Timothy. He calls him in verse 2, my dearly beloved son. We don't believe that Timothy obviously was Paul's literal physical son, but he was his son in the ministry. And he was a dearly beloved son, as that says. And he wished him grace and mercy and peace. Grace is good for difficulties, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Mercy is good for sin in Exodus 34, 7. And then we need peace about everything, according to Philippians 4, 7. Then I notice not just the intimacy, but the concern and the prayers that the Apostle Paul prayed for Timothy in verse number 3. He said, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers. I think that, that statement that I serve from my forefathers, it means that he, he served God after the same manner of his forefathers or that the worship of the true God had been passed down to him from his forefathers. And if you study something about the Apostle Paul, you'll find out that apparently his parents were very careful. Now this is going to be more applicable to the message in a few minutes, so just, just bear with me while I lay a little groundwork. So as in Acts chapter 26, here's what he said. He said, my manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, and he kept talking. And so he, apparently, his parents were interested in passing to him that faith, if you will, that, that knowledge of the God they served to their son. Philippians 3, 5, it says he was circumcised the eighth day. Well, he didn't do that, obviously. His parents made sure and saw to that. And so that which was passed from his forefathers, the knowledge of the true God had been passed down to him, and that was important. But he goes on to say, Without ceasing, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. What a prayerful man Paul was and it's awesome to think about that here's Paul praying for Timothy every day now notice verse 4 he said greatly desiring to see thee being mindful of thy tears that I may be filled with joy now Paul had obviously had a desire to be in the presence of Timothy but he did mention that he was mindful that his mind was full if you will of the tears that Timothy had shed. I don't know if Timothy had wept at their departure. I don't know if Timothy was weeping over ever-present burdens. But whatever had broken Timothy's heart, Paul was sensitive to that and, was, and had that upon his mind. And I'll tell you, we're going to face things in our lives that will bring tears, sometimes parting, sometimes burdens. And we ought to be sensitive one to another about those things that break our hearts. And then he talks about this joy, greatly desiring to see thee that I might be filled, that I may be filled with joy, but he doesn't stop there. There's a semicolon. He said, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. So it was a great joy for Paul to see Timothy, but I'm convinced from the wording of this text that it wasn't just um, the fact that Timothy was a man that brought him joy to see him. It wasn't just the fact that Timothy was a, a friend that brought him joy in seeing him. But it was something special about Timothy that caused him great joy in his presence. And, and I believe he elaborates on that in verse 5, that I may be filled with joy, verse 4, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. And so I think it was the remembrance of the faith that was in Timothy that brought Paul such joy. You know as well as I do, we could go to a 
family reunion, for instance, we could have family members and we could uh, meet with them. But if, if they're not saved and they don't know the Lord, it's hard to really joy in their presence. Even though we love them, we know where they're headed. And, and so, but if you have an individual that you love like a son in the ministry and you know the faith that's in him, then it's a great joy to be in their presence and know where they're going to spend eternity. And that brought joy to Paul's heart. And there is probably no greater joy for any of us than to know our children, our loved ones, have this faith that, are, that is in them. Not just in their head, but in them. And there's, there's a huge difference about that. And so he emphasized this in verse number 5. The, the unfeigned faith that is in thee. I want to just preach a few minutes this morning, if you'd let me, on an, on an unfeigned faith. Let me mention a few things about that. I believe that, first of all, it, it's a rare thing. It's hard to find individuals in this day with faith in God. And so I'm sure that most of us would agree that it's hard. To, there's very few people that we know that we believe truly serve God, are sold out, dedicated to God. It's a rare, and it's becoming more rare, it seems. It's a real faith. What made a young man like Timothy forsake everything and serve the Lord? What changed Saul? into the Apostle Paul that is writing this. It wasn't hypocrisy. It wasn't watered-down religion. It wasn't this feel-good message that we're hearing a lot of today. It was a faith that was a real faith, a, a real life-changing faith, a, a faith that impacted those that embraced it. And so I'll tell you, there is a lot today that is feigned. It's, it's hypocritical. But we need individuals that are not just playing the part, not just in Christians in disguise. And it seems like today uh, that so many, we know the homosexuals are coming out of the closet, but it seems like a lot of the Christians are going into the closet. And I don't understand all of that, but it was a real faith. It was right. I'm not big on alliteration. I almost hate using it because I preach against it, teach against it so much in Bible college. These men that I've taught will, will probably say, I can't believe he's giving us alliteration today. But it was right. This is the message that Jesus preached. It was the message that Paul preached to them and delivered to them. The, the faith that was passed to Timothy was a Bible faith. It was a Paul-approved faith. What kind of faith are we passing on to our children? We got to be careful about that. It was a faith that was received. Eunice received it from Lois. And Lois, it seems, our, our, our Eunice passed it on down to Timothy. And then Timothy passed it on to the multitudes and so on and so forth. You never know really what God might do with those, even your children, that you pass your faith down to. Look what God did with Timothy. I believe it was probably a ridiculed faith. This was a time of persecution, but you'll read in Acts 16 uh, that Timothy's daddy was apparently not a believer. It says he was a Greek and uh, he, probably, he probably didn't go along with a lot of the things that Timothy believed and his mother believed and so on and so forth. It was a remembered faith. He said, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith in verse number five, and we're going to be remembered for the kind of faith that we have, one, one way or the other. It was a revealed faith. Here it is revealed on the pages of God's Word and millions have read the story of the faith that was passed down through these generations and ended up. It was a rewarded faith. Can't you imagine that, that Lois and Eunice, no doubt they, they saw the fruit of the faith in Timothy's life and that was a great reward to them? Not just in this life, but in the life to come. I'm just saying this was an unfeigned faith. Now, let's get down to where I think we need to be this morning. What I'm trying to say is 
that this is what this church is here for. The faith is what we're all about. The future of, of Resurrection Baptist Church, it depends on what you do with the faith. Not just looking back and thank God for what he has done and looking around and thank God for what he is doing, but looking forward and trying our best uh, to walk the old path, the path that God has laid down uh, and embrace the faith that was once delivered to the saints and pass that faith down to the next generation. I've lived to be old enough now where I recognize that the future of Welcome Baptist Church, it really does not depend on me. It depends, though, on me passing the faith to the next generation and try my best to instill some things in them that will prevent them from going the way that multitudes are going in this day and hour. I want you to know something. I'm just thankful that I have a place I can come to in Calpin, South Carolina where I can feel that I've got the freedom and the liberty to preach this Bible just like it is to people just like they are because you can't find that everywhere. And I'm going to tell you, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the devil's going to do everything in his power to put you out of business, to shut you up, to get you sidetracked, to get you to stray away from where you are and where you've been and the path you've been trodden on. But I'm telling you, the future of America, the future of the next generation is depending on you and I to give them exactly what men of God, like Dr. Ed McAbee and others, have passed down to us. Say, Fred, you, you act like you stirred up about it. You're right, I'm stirred up about it. I am tired of what's going on. I am sick and tired of what's going on in America. And we need to realize what is happening so that we don't be a part of it, so that we don't fall into that category. He was in possession of it. Paul said, it is in thee. And the faith that was in them is the same faith that's in us. We have believed it. We have embraced it. In that same uh, body of doctrine, that's the same, the faith that's in us. It's in our possession. Thank God we have it today. Not just in my hands, but I have it in my heart. Do you have it there? I'm talking about real faith, unfeigned faith, right faith. You remember what kind I'm talking about, right? There's a lot of people that have a lot of profession but not a lot of possession when it comes to that. The possession of it. We find in verse 5 the propagation of it. They passed it from one generation. But now in verse 7 through 12, there is a, a persecution of it. Notice what the Bible has to say in verse 7. Well, let's back up to verse 6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands... For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now I want you to think about this. What, what is there to fear? He said God's not given you a spirit of fear. What, are they, what is it to be, they to be afraid of? What is there to fear? What is it that could, could shake their minds? And then look in verse 8. Be not therefore ashamed. That means to be embarrassed or to feel shame for of the testimony of our Lord nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Have you ever thought about this? You think about the, the, the words ashamed there. He talks about the testimony of our Lord and then the, the uh, partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. Where do the afflictions come from? You know what was going on in this day? There was an attack on the faith. Paul was in prison because of the faith. And that same faith that Paul is talking about that was in Timothy and his mother and his grandmother, and I'm getting ahead of myself, and he's got a responsibility to pass it on to the next generation. Paul had that faith in him, and they were suffering because of it. We've not seen much of that in America, but we're headed there. We're headed there quickly. 
And it's in my heart. I, I, like I said, I don't feel like a homecoming preacher. I'm not trying to damper homecoming at all. I'm trying to get you to see, though, that what's on the horizon and the future, I think this is a good time to think about the future. The future is at stake. And what's on the horizon is a persecution of the faith like Paul and Timothy and others. And Paul's goal in this is to say, yes, we're being persecuted. Yes, we are suffering affliction. Yes, I am in prison, he says in this text, basically. But we still have a responsibility. And he is telling them in this text about, about this great responsibility. I want you to think about the attack that there is on the faith. It's really, I think, a threefold attack. There is, first of all, a, 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 the attack that is by force and by fear. I don't know how else to say that. You realize there's people in the world today that'll kill you because of your faith? I mean, they want to shut you up Permanently if they can. They want to, to kill all the Christians. They want to silence you by force, if at all possible, and do away with the faith. So, so that is one of the attacks, and that was happening in Paul's day. In fact, he was a part of it before he got saved, right? By force. Again, we haven't faced much of that in America. Nobody's ever threatened to kill me over the gospel. I've been threatened a few times, but not killed. We've not faced that, but I believe that it's on the horizon. Brother Maccabee always said that he believed that, that the rapture would be a rescue operation, and it's looking more and more like it all the time. But they were facing afflictions. And then verse 12, notice what he said in verse 12, For the which cause I also suffer these things. There's suffering that's going on. This is physical. The second type of attack is not just by force and fear, but for lack of a better way of putting it, it's by shame and ridicule. This right here is probably the one that I've seen as many fall to as anything else. I don't know that I know anybody that's been forced to, to give up their faith or, or been killed for the faith or whatever personally. But he said in verse 8, Paul told Timothy not to be ashamed. And then I want you to notice what he said in verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. And then he talked about Onesiphorus in verse 16, if that's how you pronounce that. He said he wasn't ashamed. So there is an attack to try to shame people and ridicule and make fun of it. And that's happening today. They'll say, well, that's outdated. And they'll say, well, that's old-fashioned. And you're just a bunch of narrow-minded bigots. You see, that's not force and that's not fear, but that is ridicule, that is attacking trying to get you to be ashamed to be a Christian. Right. Trying to get you, as I said before, to go into the closet and hide yourself. And there's a lot of individuals that have fell into that snare in this day. And, and, it, and it looks like this sometimes. Well, you know, I don't want my, my daughter or my son to be made fun of at school. I want my child just to, you know, to fit in. I don't want them to be odd. And I got to thinking about that. What you're saying, and there's been, I know parents personally who have altered what they believe and what they have stood for and what they've been taught and what they know the Bible teaches. They have altered all that because of shame and ridicule. They have forsaken what the Bible says because they don't want to be an oddball or they don't want their children to be an oddball. You know what that is? That's an attack. That's not force and it's not fear, but it's ridicule. Yes, it's trying to shame us. The thing about that's so sad about that is, you know what, a parent that would fall into that category, look, I don't know you folks. I don't know if I'm preaching to any of you. I don't know if any of you are guilty of that. But I can tell you this, if, if you have not faced it, you will. Amen. Amen. 
And here's what I've seen parents do in essence. They've said to themselves apparently, I'd rather my child be like the world than to, than to face a little shame or a little ridicule and be like the Bible teaches. You really? You really want your child to be like the world so they won't feel ashamed? So they won't be ridiculed? You really want your child to be like the world? The world's against God. The world is condemned. The world passeth away in the lust thereof. You really, really, just because you won't want them to be an oddball, you really want them to be like the world that hates God, that's against God, that, uh, that wants to do away with the faith. We're not talking about the kind of faith that most of modern religion has. We're talking about real faith, right faith, unfeigned faith, faith without hypocrisy, Faith that's the same thing at, on Monday at school that it is on Sunday at church. Amen. That's the kind of faith we're talking about. Amen. An unfeigned faith. It's quiet in here this morning. I'm not here to hurt you. I'm not here to straighten you out. I don't know anything about you. As far as I know, you're, you're gun barrel straight, every one of you. As far as I know, you're not influenced by the world. As far as I know, you're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As far as I know, you're not ashamed to be. I'm just telling you what the burden of my heart is and what I'm seeing in Welcome Baptist Church and everywhere else I've been. That's what I'm seeing. Where are we going to be 10 years from now? Where's resurrection going to be 10 years from now? Where are you going to be 20 years from now? Where are you going to be 30 years from now? Where's your family going to be? Once you open the door of that compromise, that you can't hardly close it. What you, what you entertain, what you allow, the next generation's going to embrace it. I don't know why God's got me here this morning. I feel like a, I don't know, a square peg in a round hole preaching this on homecoming. But I know what's in my heart. And I know when I leave here, I believe with all my heart, I will have told you the truth. Amen. I'm not trying to be arrogant. I'm not saying I got it all figured out. I'm just saying I've seen too much. I've seen too many. I am shaken thinking about it. They're just falling by the wayside. Like what that Bible says doesn't matter anymore. Paul said, Timothy, yeah, I'm in prison. Don't be ashamed, son. I'm not ashamed. Amen. Don't back up, Timothy. You're going to suffer. I'm going to suffer. You'll be a partaker of the afflictions. I'm in jail. I've had to suffer it. But you know what he's saying? It'll be worth it when it's all said and done. Amen. Lois didn't regret it. Eunice didn't regret it. Timothy didn't Amen. regret it. Paul didn't regret it. Amen. And you won't regret it. Amen. But you will regret it. If you start compromising with this world, going the way of the world, forsaking the, the way of that Bible, you will regret it. So there is an attack. It's a forceful, fearful, I'm going to make you do it or I'm going to shame you into doing it. I'm going to make you look like an idiot if you don't. And that's what they're trying to do to us. I told the church the other day, and I haven't preached this to the church. I've never preached it before, ever. This is fresh off the press. I did give them them little R's about the faith a while back, but not this. But here's what I told them. I said, you know what? You're going to die somewhere. You're going to die somewhere in some kind of shape. You might as well just go ahead right now and pick out the hill that you're going to die on. You just might as well make your mind up. You know, and that's the thing. Here's what churches are doing. They're competing with the world. 
And if you start competing with the world, you'll never outworld the world. You let up just a little bit right here, and you know, so that you won't be quite so offensive. And a church down the road, they're going to let up just a little more. And then most churches say, well, man, they're getting the crowd. Look, We better let up a little bit more. So they let up a little bit more. And the church down the road, what do they do? Help me out. They let up a little bit more. It never ends. Well, yeah, it does end. It ends with no conviction, no standard, no whatever you want to call it. We got to draw the line somewhere. Amen. Right. I mean, just make your mind up. Here's where I'm going to draw it. Yes, sir. The only right place to draw it is is Bible. And and I I don't I hope this ain't true. I don't I don't see anybody that looks offended. Maybe a few that ain't real interested, but nobody looks offended yet. Amen. And not, I don't think it'll get any worse. So don't fear. The thing about it is, I haven't, I, ain't, I haven't told you one time in all that I've said where you ought to draw the line. Have you heard me? Now, if I started nailing it real tight, then you might say, oh, <clears throat> oh. But so far, all I've said is, there's a standard. And it's in that Bible. And you better figure out where it's at. And you better draw the line. And you might as well decide that's where I'm going to die. Shame and ridicule. There's a lot of people that have forsaken that faith that's been passed down to us because they don't want to be ashamed. And then here's the third way. By fear and force, by shame and ridicule, by subtlety and corruption. Turn back to 2 Timothy, I mean 1 Timothy chapter 4, just a second. Boy, there's a lot to preach here. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times. Hang on a minute. All right, look up here. Don't get ahead of me. You think we might be living in last days? You think we might be living in latter times? I think there's a good chance of that, don't you? I believe it it seems biblical, right? All right, so we're talking about maybe the days we're living in. I believe that. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Not all of them, thank God, but some of them. I think it'd be safe to say that in the latter times, some of us will depart from the faith. Some are going to. Part of what I'm preaching right now is I'm trying my best not to get any of us to be a part of that that some. Some's going to depart from it. So there's a departure here. How are they going to depart? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So there's a a deception. Look in verse 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. You know what unfeigned is? It's the opposite of hypocrisy. We're talking about an unfeigned, a not hypocritical faith. But they speak lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So you have people that are departing, that are seducing spirits, that are lies. There are doctrines of devils out there. This is subtlety and corruption. If the devil can't make you turn from the faith, and can't force you to, and can't shame you into it, then he's going to try to trick you. He's going to try to lure you subtly, deceivingly, 
with lies. Listen to this. The future of your home, you, your future, this church's future, the church in America's future depends on a recognition of the attacks that we're facing. We're facing a day when you don't only have to be careful or avoid blatant, open sin. The best way I know how to put this is you have to be careful about what is almost right. Most of us, if you threw a big false doctrine up here, we'd all, we, we know it was blatant, it's open, we know that ain't right, we're not following that. But the devil's a whole lot smarter than that. He's going he's gonna to make it almost right. I don't have time to get into all of it, but, but read, his, or read the story of his attack on Eve. Read the account of his attack, his temptation of Christ in the wilderness. Almost right, but not right. And that has caused a lot of individuals to stray away from that faith, that, that truth, that has been handed down to us, that has worked for generation after generation after generation. Somebody say amen right there. It hadn't changed. God hasn't changed. He hasn't changed his mind. He hasn't changed his word. The only thing that's changed is society. That's all that's changed. Help us, Lord. That brings me back to verse 13 and 14. Let's go back to our text. I'm in 1 Timothy. Let's go back to 2 Timothy. If Satan's attack is subtle and disguised, what can we do about it? We can protect the faith. Notice what he said in verse 13. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing, I believe that's talking about the faith. I'll show you that in a minute. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. You remember what Jude said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now Paul is saying, Hold fast that form of sound words. That means get a good grip on it and don't let it go. Get a grip on the sound words. That is, words that are uncorrupt. Words that are wholesome. Words that are right, not almost right. Hold those words. That good thing, keep it. That's like keeping a prism. That is, uh, be on guard, watch it, preserve it. It also can mean to obey it, like keep his commandments. Turn back with me to 1 Timothy. Look in chapter number 1. So we we just got through reading Paul saying, hold fast, keep it, guard it, obey it. 1 Timothy 1 verse 11. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. We're talking about the gospel. We're talk- it, I, I believe that's the same faith that Jude said we ought to earnestly contend for. It's that body of doctrine which has been given to us. Paul said it was committed to me. 
Now look over in chapter 6 of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 6 verse 20. First Timothy 6, verse 20. Oh, Timothy. Oh, I mean, I could just hear him. Oh, Timothy. Keep. Keep. Guard it. Watch it like a guard on prison. Preserve it. Keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings. That is what's happening. A lot of what you're reading on Facebook, a lot of what you're hearing from pulpits, it's vain and profane babblings. I wish I had time to deal with that. He said avoid that. If it's contrary to this book, avoid it. It's profane, it's vain. It's a bunch of empty noise. Oh, man, I wish I had time. And oppositions of science falsely so-called. You know what I believe that is? I'll just give this to you right quick, and I'm almost done. I know, I, I know some of you don't, don't believe me. You know what I think some of that is? I believe some of that's humanism. It's the teachings of, of evolution. They call it science, but it's falsely so-called. That's not science. It's a lie. He said avoid that mess. I don't have time. But notice what he goes on to say. Which some professing, they have embraced it. They have professed these things, have erred concerning the faith. You know what Paul told Timothy? First he said it was committed to me. Then he said it was committed to you. He said keep it, hold it. Because those who haven't, have erred from the faith. He said, avoid that. Then look in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let's go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. Paul's talking about that which I taught you. That which I preached to you, Timothy. The same. Everybody here ought to underline or circle same. The same. Commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Have you got the connection yet? Paul said it was committed to me. Paul said it was committed to you. Paul said you committed to others. But he didn't say, just you commit to others whatever you think. What did he say? What I tell you to underline. Y'all help me out. You with me, ain't you? I hope I didn't lose you. The same. (laughs) You've all heard this statement. Things that are different are not the same. Right? Simple. I'm I'm not being complicated. If it's different, it's not the same. I have been, I believe, as a preacher of the gospel, I believe it has been committed to me from great men of God. It has been passed down from that generation to my generation. I've got a responsibility to pass the same thing down to the next generation that that generation passed to me. And so do you. Not changing anything. No matter what the world does. Do you read in there where he said, you can change it if the world changes. You can change it if society changes. You can change it if it becomes unpopular. You read that anywhere anywhere in there? I didn't read that anywhere. He said the same. The future of Resurrection Baptist Church is going to depend on You passing the same thing down to the next generation that was passed to you. It's going to depend on it. You want to keep having homecomings? 
with the, with the hand of God. I felt the touch of God a while ago. I've had great liberty to preach. You can have homecomings from now on and do whatever you want to do, but God will say, have at it, I'm out of here. The future of your children, their salvation depends on staying with the stuff. The hand of God on your church, on your family, on your life. I want to ask you right quick, this just comes to my mind before I'm about to close. Some of you that are here today, is it in you? I mean, is it really in you? You say, oh yeah, I'm here. What about tomorrow? Will it be in you tomorrow? If it's in you today and not tomorrow, it's not, that's not what I'm talking about. That's not, well, that's not the kind of in you. The kind of in you that was in them went from generation to generation to generation. It was in them. Then look at verse 15. This thou knowest, Timothy, I know you know this, he said that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. That may have been a big crowd. And I'm going to tell you something. If you stay with it, they're going to turn away from you too. John told us they turned away from Jesus. You say, well, the reason they're turning away is because we're just too narrow-minded, we're just too straight, we're just too strict, we're too strong, we're too what, biblical. <laughs> you might as well just say that. We're just too biblical. Jesus had the same problem. I don't mind being in the same boat he did. He was in, do you? Let me just read it to you. Listen to what John said. I'm trying to quit. John chapter 6, if you want to look at it, verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will ye also go away? He lost many of them. Many of them. Paul and Timothy, he said all of them in Asia turned away. All of them did. And if you stay with it, they're going to leave you too. You just might as well expect it. But that same John that witnessed that in the gospel and wrote it, he also wrote this. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. By the grace of God, let us not be one of them. On this homecoming day, may Resurrection Baptist Church be more determined than ever to hold fast and to keep the faith. And to pass the same thing, though many may walk away. Pass the same thing down to the next generation. The truth is, the truth that has been committed to us is a trust that's been committed to us, Matthew Henry said. We've been entrusted with it. It is, he said, a jewel of unspeakable value and advantage for it reveals to us the unsearchable riches of Christ. It is a trust committed to us. It is a jewel of unestimable value that we have. And then I, I added a third one to his list. It is a responsibility, a huge responsibility that we have to pass it on. What's my word to you? My final word? Stay with it. Just, just stay with it. You'll be glad you did. 